So today I'm going to focus mostly on the book that um, is about to come out on U.S. immigration crises um, in the 21st century and radical sanctuary movements. Um, I'll also brief briefly situate this project in terms of my previous research, which is sitting over there, um, on uh, U.S. prison camps. Um, so I'm pulling together a lot of different threads in this talk in a really short amount of time, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion. On January 27th, 2017, the White House issued the so-called Muslim ban, immediately barring the entry of all Syrian refugees as well as any traveler from seven Muslim-majority countries. It came on the heels of two other executive orders, one authorizing a big, beautiful wall along the U.S.-Mexico border, and another ramping up interior and immigration enforcement, executed through ICE raids. These three executive orders represent an unprecedented executive attempt to alter immigration policy without congressional debate and approval. Together, they have defined our current approach towards immigrants by bans, walls, and raids. Together, they would just be justified by vilifying immigrants as threats that must be expelled for our security. But this is not the whole story. On January 28, 2017, within hours of learning that the Muslim ban had gone into effect, thousands of ordinary people showed up at airports nationwide to fight this policy in particular and the new executive branch in general. These protests joined the mass demonstrations of resistance against the 45th U.S. president from its first day. Um, and it have continued in the form of litigation, defiant local jurisdictions, community defense uh, committees, and more, and not solely for immigrants. So on the one hand, immigration has become the central platform of the president's efforts to make America great again, in part because immigration control is, as Kelly Lotto Hernandez argues, one of the least constitutional and most racist realms of governance in US law and life. On the other hand, these attacks on immigrants do not stand alone. Alongside the ban walls and raids, the executive branch has taken aim at a range of ordinary people and the planet, while promoting corporate capital, military investment, and law and order regimes. So while the current regime is fortifying the violence tying our fates together, these targeted actions emerge from a shared foundation that stretches back to the United States' very origins. To understand how we got here, we need to grapple with the fact that these attacks on our neighbors and our democracy are neither un-American nor historically unique. So this means two things. First, understanding these crises requires a deep historical understanding of bans, walls, and raids. These historical threads are rooted in the settler colonial foundations of the United States, the origins of immigration restrictions in the late 19th century, and the escalating processes of criminalization in the late 20th century to the present. Second, the fact that these crises have long been building means that they will not end when the current regime does. The conditions that have allowed bans, walls, and raids will persist even if what follows, like what preceded it, comes dressed in finer language and more respectable politics. So, what if ha is, so if what is happening today is not new, not normal, and not ending anytime soon, then what is to be done? So conceptually, I look to sanctuary as offering not so much a roadmap to these challenges as a capacious concept, a deep genealogy, and a recurrent social movement that can inform what can be done. Indeed, the terrors of contemporary immigration policy have invigorated the decades-old U.S. sanctuary movement. Since 2016, the number of sanctuary jurisdictions has jumped from a few dozen in 2010 to more than 600 in 2017. More congregations have declared themselves sanctuaries, and the idea has spread to new sites like schools, mass transit systems, restaurants, and even homes. It is no surprise, then, that the Trump administration has attacked sanctuary, right? So most recently, he's sending these militarized like SWAT teams right, from Border Patrol into sanctuary cities to sweep up immigrants right, from their communities. So that's just one example. So I want to think through the challenges and limits of sanctuary while also arguing for its significance and guiding the work ahead. Not only does sanctuary carry an expansive genealogy rooted in the ethical demand to care for one another, but it also poses a fundamental challenge to state sovereignty, particularly that of settler colonial states and their commitments to bans, walls, and raids. 
Sanctuary challenges state sovereignty in, may, in ways that might help us open our relations to each other beyond the dictates of national identity or citizenship. So in what follows, I'll very briefly outline the deep history of bans, walls, and raids, and then speak to how this history can inform a radical sanctuary movement that, in Angela Davis's words, grasps things at the root and links the struggles of targeted peoples. But first, let me outline how this project relates to my previous work. Yes, <laughs> still excited. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay, so in taking a contemporary perceived crisis, and investigating how it didn't come out of nowhere, my current book uh, shares similar themes and motivations that drove my previous research on US prison camps, as well as nascent thoughts on my next, next project. I have, an, I have now a new project, and my next, next project on military outsourcing and labor migrations. So overall, my research examines how the US state fosters violence against targeted peoples, like prisoners, immigrants, and racial outcasts. So I use interdisciplinary, intersectional approaches that seek to understand the shared roots of seemingly disparate forms of oppression that link together struggles for social justice. So for example, in my first book, I developed the concept of rightlessness by studying a central paradox of US political culture. The United States champions the rights of all and simultaneously renders people rightless. I examine how the US creates rightless subjects, those removed from the social and political community that can guarantee their right to have rights by imprisoning them in camps. So to make this argument, I examine the historical conditions and testimony of three sets of rightless subjects. Japanese American internees, or Japanese Americans interned during World War II, who then fought for redress in the late 1980s, HIV-positive Haitian migrants uh, indefinitely detained at Guantanamo in the early 1990s, and the so-called enemy combatants held at Guantanamo under the War on Terror, 40 of whom still exist there. So one of the key claims that motivates the book is that, Guantanamo, that, is that the Guantanamo camps of the War on Terror are not unique to United States history, despite the well-meaning but historically inaccurate and politically dubious uh, proclamations of progressive journalists, academics, and lawyers, right? So um, if you guys remember, if you guys were old enough, back when Guantanamo opened, there was so much hand-wringing in the progressive press and among lawyers and among people like us, like this is not who we are. Right? So, like when these kinds of images came out, right? This is so un American. How could we possibly be doing this? And I'm saying that all of this is the predictable consequence of US history. Okay? So, I argue that Guantanamo emerged as a foreseeable consequence of our history and culture. This is American, right? This is exactly who we are. It doesn't have to be, though, right? So, by reading these three sites of investigation together, um, the book argues uh, how, or the book shows how uh, camps, imprisonment, and rightlessness are as integral to the United States as its professed commitments to liberty and rights. In the same post-war era that saw the U.S. rise to become the self-proclaimed guardian of rights, it has produced a proliferation of rightless people. And it is this contradiction that stands at the center of the book. So the concept of rightlessness both as a theoretical vantage point and a lived experience, confronts and interprets this seeming paradox. So rightlessness, I define it as a multivalent concept, one defined uh, not only by the dispossession of rights, like due process, but also by the removal from the social and political community that could guarantee one's right to have rights in the first place. So furthermore, at the very center of rightlessness, following John Beverly, is not mattering, not being worth listening to. And so the camp represents the physical embodiment of that removal. What allows rightless people to be subjected to the camp is the fact that they already do not matter because they have been branded as outcasts, as enemies, contaminants, combatants, a troubling classification that adheres readily to racialized others. We can see this with the coronavirus, right, right now. Um, and their not mattering is dramatically reinforced by their imprisonment. So the camp makes it harder for prisoners to communicate with us at all, let alone in a way that we would find worth listening to, that would compel us to do something to get them out of that situation, right? So on the one hand, the book focuses on camps as 
uh, as sites of intense racialized domination that enable us to see the legal discourses, infrastructures, and mechanics that produce rightlessness. So I see these camps as kind of laboratories of um, US state power, right? US imperial state power. On the other hand, I also argue that US prison camps are not exceptional, even though we cast them as such, right? Camps could not exist, and people could not be rendered rightless without camp thinking which is Paul Gilroy's term for nationalist and racist invocations of racial difference. And because we are set against each other by camp thinking to begin with, a direct relationship binds the racist nationalism that is considered conventional, right, with the camps that are seen as exceptional. Indeed, many of the techniques used within, within the camps are only steroidal versions of mundane practices used within the United States, particularly within the realms of imprisonment and immigration. Right? So um, one of the examples that I talk about in the book um, is uh, force feeding. Right? So force feeding is seen as like this incredibly intense, terrible thing, which it is, that we inflict on Guantanamo hunger strikers. But how did Guantanamo make that decision? They called up the Bureau of Prisons. Right? The Bureau of Prisons sent consultants down there, and they were saying to the Guantanamo administrators, what you should do is you should strap them down into this torture chair and shove a feeding tube up their noses. They didn't get that idea on their own. They got it from regular practices that we use in supermax prisons all the time in the United States. Okay? So, as in Guantanamo, indefinite detention, solitary confinement, and suspension of due process are mundane in US prisons and immigration enforcement regimes. So rather than an absolute gap, a murky spectrum exists between the rightful and the rightless, spanning from the camp's architects to their inmates, with many gradations in between. So put differently, rightlessness bleeds into the regular spaces and practices of US statecraft. Indeed, camp, casting camps as exceptional conceals how the powers that produce rightlessness are in fact spreading. Right? So as Gilroy argues, though the trains are not necessarily being loaded right now in our own neighborhoods, our conduct must be closely guided, not just by this terrible history, but by the knowledge that these awful possibilities are always much closer than we like to imagine. And this is becoming increasingly clear as we're seeing in the escalation in the state tactics that create rightlessness under the current administration. So as with the opening of the Guantanamo camps, I am responding to the need to interpret uh, the contemporary moment in ways that can both hold on to the fear and rage it invokes and also understand how embedded it is in US history, culture, and politics. So I want to do both things, right? This is not new, new, right? So it's deeply rooted. And also, th there's an escalation. And the real fear that a lot of people have, right, and the terrors that they're feeling because of the contemporary uh, conditions, we need to hold on to that and be mobilized by it, OK? All right, you still with me? Yeah. OK, great. OK. Um, so in the current book, um, I start each chapter with one of those executive orders um, that I talked about, the ban wall and raids, um, and trace their deep histories reaching back to two foundational moments. So first is the settler colonial origins of the United States. So because it is a settler state, one built on the colonization of land taken from its original peoples, the United States needed migration in its early years, thereby creating remarkably open immigration policies for Europeans. This settler colonization also required alienating indigenous people from their own land. Only European settlers could be identified as belonging to the land and the land belonging to him, as Letty Volpe states so well. And the settler logic of destroy to replace constitutes the organizing principle of the United States and for everyone in it, not just the indigenous. As Lytle Hernandez argues, settler colonial societies strive to exclude racial others by deporting, hiding, or criminalizing them or otherwise revoking the right of racialized outsiders to be within United States territory. OK, so put differently, settler colonialism is central not only to the destruction and resistance of indigenous peoples, but also to the uh, exclusion, containment, and removal of racial others who do not fit into the ideal settler society, which in the United States has been defined by whiteness. 
And we can see this um, essential whiteness at the center of US identity in, for example, the 1790 Naturalization Act that limited citizenship solely to free white persons. Right? So even Native Americans born outside US territory but within their ancestral lands were barred from having US citizenship. You get me? Follow? OK. So settlers exclude these racial others even while relying on them for their exploitable la labor to build and sustain an, ideal, an idealized settler community. So we can see, uh, see this clearly in the history of slavery in the US Constitution. Um, which commanded that any self-emancipated black person must be returned to their masters, right? So essentially, U.S. democracy was built for free white persons on the theft of land from indigenous people and on the enslavement of, enslavement of African-descended people. So every law that has expanded the terms of inclusion, like the 14th Amendment, has modified these fun fundamental uh, exclusions. So fully coming to terms with this fact requires acknowledging that US liberal democratic principles fester at the roots of our current conditions. Liberalism is not the solution to our problems, it is the problem. You get me? Okay, so in addition to settler colonialism, each chapter also reaches back to the foundational emergence of immigration restrictions in the late 19th century, which has always been shaped by racism, capitalist labor exploitation, fears of disease and disability, and so on. And so we see these in these origins in the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which targeted Chinese women and workers, weaving gender, race, and class-based exclusions into that original immigration ban, right? So furthermore, once the US state started, it really got on a roll very, very fast, right? So the federal government then turned quickly to target any convict, lunatic, idiot, or any person likely to become a public charge. So again, this contemporary, um, fear over the public charge uh, exclusions of immigrants, this is not some new thing, right? This goes back to this, one of the primary exclusion laws in our, in our nation's history, in our immigration history, right? Um, so geographic exclusions um, extended from Asia, from China and then to Asia, and then to the rest of the world with the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act, which was the first globally comprehensive immigration restriction system. And so um, similar to what we have with the Muslim ban, um, debates for the Johnson-Reed Act uh, were rooted in anti-Semitism, right? And the act became a source of inspiration for Hitler as a common sense uh, policy to achieve racial purity. So if you look at the congressional debates, you'll see that there is a lot of kind of substituting Eastern and Southern Europe for as a proxy for uh, keeping out Jews, right? Who were considered filthy and dangerous to the United States. And so the Muslim ban is doing something similar. It's not saying no Muslims, it's saying no Muslims from these countries that happen to be Muslim majority countries, right? And so here's the quote from Mein Kampf, which was um, written one year after uh, the passage of the Johnson-Reed Act, right? So alongside the Johnson-Reed Act, Congress uh, created the Border Control, right? And passed a law that criminalized crossing the border without authorization. So again, what we're seeing at the U.S.-Mexico border goes back to 1929. Again, it is not new, okay? Um, so the so-called tribal 20s, right, mark the most restrictionist era in U.S. history, characterized by xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Jim Crow segregation, the Klan, and the doctrine that America should remain American, as President Calvin Coolidge stated when signing the Johnson-Reed Act. It is thus unsurprising that former Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions aspires to return the U.S. to this period. As he laments here, the 1965 hart seller Act, which finally eliminated racist national origin quotas, um, while it did uh, uh, increase immigration from non-European countries, the hart seller Act also imposed numerical restrictions on the Western Hemisphere for the first time, despite deep histories of cross-border connections leading to the f increased illegalization of Latin American migrants. Okay, so if the illegal, if the essential illegal immigrant in the late 19th century through the early 20th century was an Asian person, it really makes a shift in the, uh, in the, with the 1965 Act, where the um, paradigmatic illegal immigrant is then identified as a Latinx person, right? Okay, so, um, and as you can see here, like, uh, well, actually, I'm going to hold that. I'll come back to this in just a second. Okay, so... Um, as we see, we see this escalation of restrictions, but these restrictions have never achieved their goal, 
right? They've never stopped people from moving across borders, whether Chinese workers in the late 19th century or Latin American migrants in the late 20th century. And officials have long known this to be true. So in 1927, Labor Secretary James Davis stated, uh, we could not stop them. Not even a Chinese wall, 9,000 miles in length and built over rivers and deserts and mountains and along seashores would seem to permit a permanent solution. And yet we keep on going back to these, we keep on pursuing these failed policies with ever increasing intensity, right? Especially um, in the era of neoliberalism over the past 50 years, right? So um, as you read the book, you'll see that uh, I go over all this history and each chapter, it kind of like becomes much more intense once we get into the era of neoliberalism, which starts in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Okay, so this amped up enforcement and escalating criminalization finds its structural roots in the same period as the Hart Seller Act, act um, with 1968 as a pivotal year, marked not only by revolution and counter revolution. So think about like the Panthers, um, feminist movements, the anti war movement, and then like Nixon, right? Revolution and counter revolution, but also by a massive global recession and the end of the golden age of US capitalism. So the convergence of these social and political economic convulsions paved the way for a radical restructuring away from military Keynesianism or the warfare, uh, welfare state um, to neoliberal policies that invested in capital, divested from labor and society, and dealt with the fallout of that organized abandonment by disciplining surplus populations, justifying all of this by capitalizing on fears of economic insecurity and displacing them onto scapegoated others. So let me go back to this. Uh, Jeff Sessions quote. So think about this quote, what, he, what is he saying here, right? He's pinning the decline of the US middle class on increased immigration, right? Particularly from the darker nations, right? Post-colonial decolonized nations, right? What this does, it doesn't just pin the blame on those other others, right? It's also deflecting our attention from the structural roots of the decline of the US middle class, which has to do with the decimation of the welfare state, right? And the investment in corporate capital. Right? This is the beginning of what we have now, where you have the 1% taking more and more and more and leaving everyone else behind. Right? But if we blame immigrants, we don't see all of the like, boring stuff like tax policy right? and how it like, basically eviscerates the conditions for us to be able to go to college without going into massive debt. Do you see what I'm saying here? Okay? So this is the same kind of logic that um, the anti-immigrant movement has been using for a really long time. Okay, so with their pervasive ad adoption, neoliberal policies have disenfranchised and dislocated regular people in the United States, right, and around the world, left behind by decimated economies and disappearing jobs. So as Ruthie Gilmore argues, such people already within the United States and moving to the United States were subject to these same forces. So she states, those left behind were stuck in space, lacking the social or financial mobility to follow capital, while international migrants arrived in the US, pulled across territory by the same forces that were producing the US cataclysm. Okay, so think about, for example, like Detroit or South Central LA, right? Whole factories closed down, just like leaving all the workers behind, right? And moving to other places where labor costs are much lower. Right? Those people who are left behind in Detroit are stuck in space. They're displaced in place. Right? Whereas at the same time, their um, international migrants are being disrupted from their own local economies and they have to follow capital across borders. Right? But the structural roots of these two kinds of displacement are the same. Okay, so think about this in terms of solidarity. This also means that those um, for example, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people who are documented not to work, and those immigrant workers who are not documented to work, like undocumented workers, have the potential to make an enormous power base. Right? We're talking about somewhere between 60 and 100 million people. This is also from Ruthie Gilmore. Okay? Everyone follow? I'm throwing so much at you. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the book both goes back to U.S. origins, um, but it also speaks, picks up speed in the era of neoliberalism in the late 20th century. And so um, I trace laws and policies passed from Reagan to Obama, marking several key turning points in immigration policy, including 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which provided both a path to citizenship and yet more intense enforcement. 
1996, well, the whole Clinton era, he was so terrible. He was so deeply terrible. Like, I cannot emphasize this enough. He was so deeply terrible for so many people, okay? So he um, pushed this massive criminalization of U.S. citizens as well as immigrants, right? As well as further dismantled the welfare state. Right? Um, I look at 9-11 with the fusing, which fused uh, national security and immigration control and intensified anti-Muslim racism, which again is not some new thing that happened at 9-11, but has really, really deep roots. And then I also look at the Obama era and his kind of discourses around the felons, not families policies that uh, divided good immigrants from those bad immigrants, um, like those who crossed the border without authorization. And I'll return to this point in a minute. Okay. So the point of all of this history, right, um, is to show that the Trump uh, administration has a robust foundation to build on, right? We have been living with aggressive policing practices, miles of border fencing, anti-Muslim racism, uh, raids, mass trials, and the separation of children from their families for decades, right? So the history of bans, walls, and raids brings together vectors of power around race, gender, sexuality, national origin, religion, neurodiversity, and physical disability. In other words, the state has long been making the connections for us, right? The state already has an intersectional analysis, if from the dark side, right? Okay, so the problem is not Donald Trump. The problem is the United States of America. That is the argument of the book. I still want you to buy it and read it, okay? But that's basically the argument, okay? So while the administration's actions are not new, they have made clearly visible the fundamental problems seething at the foundations of the United States. They are also inciting more people to oppose this rising regime, right? Many under the banner of sanctuary, okay? So as this historical outline shows, Multiple oppressions work together and thus demand multi-fronted struggles. So while recognizing its limits, I argue for sanctuary's potential. In particular, an abolitionist approach to sanctuary can help us uh, not only defend uh, communities right now, but also help us envision and build the future that we deserve. Okay, so in this section, I'm gonna talk about genealogies of sanctuary, genealogies of abolition, the limits of current liberal forms of sanctuary, and then I'm gonna argue for an abolitionist vision of sanctuary. So that's what's gonna happen in the next couple, like 20 minutes, okay? Okay, so let me start with sanctuary. So sanctuary's millennial old, millennia old history and contemporary iterations reveal its fundamental confrontation with sovereign power and the potential to contest state violence via multiple positions, including local jurisdictions and religious spaces. It offers a capacious concept with roots in religious and ethical genealogies um, that it carries with it even into secular contexts. So defined as a holy place, a place that offers refuge, and even since 2018, a city of refuge, sanctuary denotes a spatial notion, right? A place of protection or safe harbor. It also includes the practices of protection beyond the law, signaling its fraught relationship to the state. It's fundamentally contesting the state, okay? Um, sanctuary practices stretch back through recorded history and variations of, of it are found across religious traditions, right? So indeed, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam all root their origin stories in sanctuary, in the stories of Exodus, Christmas, and the Hejira. The concept is also found in the holy demand that we treat the stranger with hospitality as if they were our neighbor. Indeed, as Michael Schmaltz emphasizes, in the New Testament, stranger and neighbor are synonymous. Sanctuary movements also trace their roots to Greco-Roman and medieval Europe. Churches granted sanctuary to fugitives from blood feuds and from harsh government punishments, grounding their ability to grant mercy in divine powers that prevail over any civil authority. Right? These fugitives were not always sympathetic figures, which is an important thing to hold in your mind. Right? They included people who committed serious offenses, including murder. However, by the 16th century, the fact that sanctuary existed as an alternative space and practice threatened the emerging nation state. Right? With sanctuary spaces carving out so many small sovereignties and undermining its exclusive territorial control, the modern nation state consolidated its power in part by eradicating sanctuary. 
So the legal system is then emerging based on liberal notions of political egalitarianism, purportedly ensured fairness for all people, and thus claimed that sanctuary enabled wrongdoers to evade justice. So one of the examples is that debtors would go into sanctuary and then not have to pay off their debts, and that seemed unfair. So now we have this fair court system that everyone should have to go through, and therefore sanctuary doesn't really have a purpose anymore. Okay. Um, because it endows the state with the authority to determine justice without exception or alternative, political liberalism um, is antithetical to sanctuary. Indeed, sanctuary's eradication became a signifier of modern progress. However, though formally eliminated, sanctuary practices keep re-emerging because the equality of all pers uh, persons uh, uh, sorry, because the equality of all persons before the law never came to pass. As we know, while liberal political philosophy claims ideals of universal equality and fairness, these ideals never considered including in the community of equals those subjected to extermination, slavery, labor exploitation, patriarchal subordination, and so on. Right? As Elizabeth Brunig argues, we did not trade mercy for justice we find ourselves both unjust and merciless. <clears throat> so US history obviously shines glaring light on the failure of liberal principles to secure justice for all. And so sanctuary practices return again and again. Secular and religious movements have given sanctuary to fugitives in need of safe harbor from violent threat, right? Um, and sanctuary has been given precisely because justice would not be which raises another genealogical threat I want to bring in, that of abolition. <clears throat> so the abolitionist movement to end slavery, the Underground Railroad, and the efforts to resist the Fugitive Slave Acts put sanctuary principles into action while seeking to upend a society built on slavery. Grounded in authority, the authority of the US Constitution, the Fugitive Slave Acts put federal power and resources behind recapturing the self-emancipated and returning them to bondage. These laws further criminalized not only the act of helping fugitives from slavery, but also the refusal to help recapture them, right? So we can see, again, some genealogical threads with the, water, the people who provide water in the Sonoran Desert. Right? Okay, they're not necessarily guiding them across the border, they're just helping them survive, like not die in the border. That is being criminalized as a federal crime. Okay, same thing with the Fugitive Slaves Acts, right? <clears throat> or something similar with the Fugitive Slave Acts. But free black people and abolitionists deployed both legal and grassroots tactics to resist these, dracon these draconian laws. As Eric Foner highlights, northern states passed laws barring officials from uh, assisting in kidnapping and returning black people to slavery, and courts used writs of habeas corpus to prevent their return. Northern juries refused to convict defendants uh, who violated the Fugitive Slave Act. Vigilance communities took direct action, storming courtrooms to free recaptured slaves and send them on the Underground Railroad. Churches, following the biblical di dictate not to give to his master a slave who has escaped, provided sanctuary to black fugitives. So abolitionist and formerly enslaved people defied federal law at risk of punishment or return to bondage to sustain the in Underground Railroad, transporting and harboring tens of thousands on their northbound journeys to freedom. So following Stephen Best and Saidia Hartman, they understood that Contrary to the state's narrative of the dangerous fugitive whose purpose is to justify police power it is, and its authority to capture and kill, it is in fact state violence and brutality that created the identity of the fugitive. See what I'm saying here? Okay. Um, so abolitionists refused, refused to concede to the state's sovereignty and its unjust laws that hunted self-emancipated self people who were definitively excluded from the promises of U.S. liberal democracy. The state could not government, govern them. They made themselves ungovernable. So the Underground Railroad and the defiance of the Fugitive Slave Acts contrast against contemporary iterations of sanctuary movements, which often, often operate within the limits of liberalism, even though liberalism is fundamentally antagonistic to the concept of sanctuary. So in holding off state violence for now, such liberal sanctuary policies operate in a paradox. It is not possible to provide sanctuary while giving credence to the state. 
right? Um, and yet, some liberal sanctuary policies operate as if recognition by the state that targets non-citizens will protect them from harm, right? So we're like asking the state to give us protection even though it's the state that's pursuing um, like our oppression, right? Okay, so some existing sanctuary policies welcome good law-abiding immigrants while further casting out bad law-breaking persons. Chicago, where I live, for example, um, justifies its sanctuary policies in terms of policing, right? Since it, um, the sanctuary policy states, uh, the cooperation of immigrant communities is essential to maintain public order. Okay, so this is the same police department that, as the Justice Department noted, does not enforce the law but frequently operates outside of it. I mean, we, like, we've had a torture center, right? A, bla a domestic black site. Right, that would sweep away mostly black and brown people without any kinds of due process, right, until they falsely confess to murdering people. Some of those people are still in prison even though it has been proven that they were tortured into false confessions. This is the same police department that shot Laquan McDonald. Do you know what I'm saying? So this, like, there's not, there, there's a fundamental contradiction here on saying that we're gonna, like, our sanctuary uh, policies protect people and we protect people by policing. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so in Chicago, immigrants merely suspected of a criminal offense or included in the gang database, which requires little more than wearing dark baggy clothing while living in the wrong neighborhood, are not protected by sanctuary. Right, these are the carve outs. So like terror watch lists that target Arab and Muslims, Arabs and Muslims, gang databases operate through racial profiling. This is like the most obvious statement ever. Um, clearly, we have drifted um, very far from the historical meaning of sanctuary, which, which accepted anyone as deserving of protection without question, including, like I said before, murderers. Okay, so by working within a framework of liberal democracy and even of law and order, these sanctuary policies shore up the notion that undocumented immigrants deserve inclusion in our communities, but implicitly concede that their membership is contingent, right? They have to stay a good immigrant. They can't slide into becoming a bad immigrant, right? They have to be the good immigrant who submits to capitalist extraction of their labor and to the state's unjust criminal justice system. Implicitly, those other bad immigrants haven't earned the right to have rights among us. So the defense of the good immigrant does not destabilize, but actually strengthens the legitimacy of criminalization overall, right? even while demanding exception to it. But as the history of bans, walls, and raids shows, what counts as a crime is not static, but is constantly shifting and has indeed been expanding over the past 50 years. So regardless of how hardworking family-oriented and deferential to law enforcement uh, they try to be, any undocumented immigrant is still a fair target. So here we see liberal sanctuary's core contradiction. Being a law-abiding good immigrant will not save you as long as the state gets to decide uh, what it means to be a good immigrant. Indeed, as the impossible subject, the unauthorized immigrant is a person who cannot be and a problem that cannot be solved. They are the constitutive outside that defines the community of the included. As Lisa Cacho argues, the illegal alien forms the foundation of immigration law and therefore cannot be incorporated into it. And this contradiction speaks to the central problem of rights and rightlessness. Because they are co-constitutive, um, rights cannot solve the problem of rightlessness. The most it can achieve is exceptions to the exclusions central to liberal governance. Okay, so again, I don't know if you've noticed, but like liberalism is the problem. <laughs> okay, yes. All right, so what then? What do we do? What is to be done? So what I would argue for then is heeding lessons from earlier sanctuary models like those emerging from resistance to slavery and from medieval Europe. How might the unauthorized uh, immigrants' position of fugitivity, their transgression of the proper, their disruption and disorder, open up new possibilities of social life into what Fred Moten calls the fugitive being of infinite humanity? So while critical of its current liberal attachments, I'm not yet willing to abandon sanctuary altogether. I want to think through how sanctuary might enable us uh, to communally defend people targeted by the state and capital, but to also rethink our notions of affiliation that challenge the nation state and capital altogether. 
So by refusing to cooperate with unjust law and providing refuge to the targeted, sanctuary can conceptually work to destabilize the criminalization and expulsion of non-citizens and other vulnerable peoples. Um, by providing local commitments, declarations of sanctuary enact a notion of belonging and relationality that isn't beholden to the sovereign nation state. Right? Contesting federal policies, subnational sanctuary jurisdictions translate abstract human rights into concrete policies backed up by their institutions. For example, not asking a uh, place of birth or um, country of origin. Right? Um, meanwhile, supranational formations like human rights regimes and international solidarity movements provide subjugated peoples alternative venues to demand justice beyond the nation state. So we can see such claims to supranational formations in the We Charge Genocide campaigns that went to the United Nations in 1951 and in 2014 to protest the hyper-policing of criminalized Chicago youth. However, the fact that human rights institutions fail to rein in violations committed uh, by sovereign states like the United States points to the limits of seeking recognition from institutional powers at all. Okay, so it's not like these youth went to the UN expecting the UN to stop the police violence against them, right? They did it to raise the profile and lift up the research that they had done to document what the police had been doing to them in their communities, right? And to get people to listen to them, right? To have their voices matter in a way that would do something, right? What is more important about this, uh, the We Charge Gen, or there are many things that are important that came out of this, but I think one of the more important things about it is that all of these youth um, who were mobilized by this action then went on to do other kinds of actions and become part leaders in other kinds of campaigns. Right? So many of these organizers of the We Charge Genocide campaign have shifted into movements to erase the gang database and stop a cop academy uh, from being built, a $95 million cop academy. Right? These campaigns crucially unite immigrant justice and abolitionist movements uh, let me show you. Yeah. Um, and abolitionist movements that seek to tear down forms of state violence and capitalist dispossession while demanding investment in institutions of community building, like schools and mental health centers, which were massively closed under the Rahm Emanuel administration. Right? So he closed like 50 um, public schools in the south and west sides in the same areas that are hyper policed. Right? And it's also the same areas where this $95 million COP Academy will be built. So this campaign. Um, was not successful, but they're still fighting against it, okay? So these young people are guided by radical analyses that grasp things at the root, making demands on state institutions, but also looking beyond them, indeed directly, directly challenging their very legitimacy. Put differently, these organizers adopt strategies that grapple with criminalization itself, enacting an abolitionist approach to sanctuary. So an abolitionist sanctuary combines two concepts that might uh, not seem to align. It connects sanctuary's radical welcome, its judgment-free embrace of anyone, to abolition, the social justice organizing that seeks to tear down oppressive structures like prison systems and build a just, equitable world in their place, one in which we refuse to solve problems by resorting to violence or to create illusions of safety for some by violating others. So an abolitionist sanctuary combines the community defense that is needed right now with the deep envisioning and building of a new society where we welcome all our neighbors. It is guided less by creating a specific space of safety for a select few. Instead, it seeks to create a society where no one, regardless of citizenship status, criminal record, poverty, ability, or any other factor is discarded as unworthy of economic means, affirming social relationships, or political power. It strives for, is not, for what is not yet here, even as it works under uh, current conditions. Right? Um, indeed, sanctuary's defense is necessary right now because we have not achieved the justice, just society abolitionists aspires to create. So an abolitionist sanctuary thus operates in the time of what Best and Hartman call fugitive justice between the no longer and the not yet, between the destruction of the old world and the awaited hour of deliverance. The lines of solidarity, sanctuary, and contestation of United States sovereignty move in all directions across multiple borders. 
So in closing, I'll focus on one example of that community defense right now that also encourages us to think about reimagining our relationships to each other for the future. Okay. So as part of the massive airport protest that I began this talk with, the members of the Tongva Nation joined with other Native peoples to host a welcoming ceremony at LAX airport for those migrants and refugees barred from entering the United States by the Muslim ban. So welcoming the excluded, these indigenous activists uh, asserted their claims to the US, at, uh, to US lands as its original peoples and opposed any right of the United States uh, that, that the United States claimed to keep out others. So as Nick Estes of the Lower Brule Sioux tribe noted, welcoming refugees and Muslim migrants not only recognized their humanity in distinction to the United States, but it also contested the US settler state, which does not have the final say on who or what comes into the country or exclusive ownership over who and what counts as human. So the United States, like all nation states, Imagine that it maintains sole control and authority over its entire territory and everyone who lives in it. This is its sovereign power. So this exercise of authority seems so entrenched and ordinary as to be unremarkable. But this belief that US sovereign power aligns fully and seamlessly with its territory is not and has never been true. As the genealogy of sanctuary shows, there have always been spaces internal to the, to the nation's territory where the state does not exert full sovereign power, right? In those religious spaces where the sovereign state cannot intrude, or more recently in sanctuary jurisdictions that can test the power of the federal government to dictate how they engage with their residents. So the settler colonial history and contemporary condition of the United States also exposes the fiction that the U.S. is the sole sovereign, nation, uh, sole sovereign here. So the land that we ordinarily think of as the United States holds many sovereign nations. These multiple sovereigns also expand visions of how to think about our relationships to both the place and the people in it, one that is not confined to notions of US citizenship. So more important, the United States is not the original or rightful sovereign of this land. So acknowledging that the US exists on territory seized through settler colonialism raises the question of whether I get to claim this land as my own and whether I have the right to prevent anyone else from settling here as well, as, the, as uh, historian Elizabeth Ellis of the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma argues. So the right to exclude others cannot be granted to those living on occupied territory. There, cannot, there can be no ban on stolen land. So performing the welcoming ceremony as the land's uh, original inhabitants worked, in Estes's words, to reclaim our sovereignty, our citizenship, and more importantly, our kinship. These native activists draw on an indigenous politics that rejects the legitimacy of the United States and challenges the exclusion that defines a nation's uh, citizenry. They articulate different ways of relating to each other that are instead created by members of the community, particularly those dehumanized by the US, cast as illegal, terrorist, criminal, and expendable. Indeed, multiple indigenous nations offer alternative models of relationality and nationhood that may help us reimagine solutions. These models uh, conceive of belonging and affiliation with each other through reciprocal obligations among humans and resources, and one that sees consensual incorporation and inclusion as a way to expand power rather than as a threat to the state, as Ellis notes. This means that sanctuary is not an act of charity for others, as it has often been cast as and often has been exercised as, right? But sanctuary can be uh, a process of establishing reciprocal relationships with each other, with the original inhabitants of this place, and with the land on which we all live. Many of us are the purported beneficiaries of systems that have not only dislocated people through economic and military violence that it drives people to migrate in the first place, but that also criminalize and sweep away others for our supposed safety. So this abolitionist approach to sanctuary has the potential to reconceive of membership and affiliation beyond the legal status provided by the state. It communicates to the excluded, 
the undocumented, criminalized, convicted, and outcast. That legal status doesn't mean anything, right? The only thing that matters is that you are here with us. This means that I am obligated to you, I'm accountable to you, and you are also accountable to me, right? Um, the state doesn't get to decide who, I dis who I'm related to, okay? Um, so the solidarity organizing that drives sanctuary is about defending each other, but it is also about protecting the very grounds of our relations to each other, of the ability to defend each other in the first place. As the abolitionist organization Mijente declares, the only community of sanctuary uh, is an organized one. Thank you very much.